I'm so glad you've decided to join us for another Receiving the Word presentation. I'd like to invite you to go to our website to receive more messages at www.saccentral.org. Click on the Media Resources tab and you'll find everything that you need right there. But for now, we have a presentation just for you. So make sure you've got your Bible in hand as we go live now to another timely Bible message. Number six, the giving of the Israelites included both material goods and services. Uh, two things, essential elements were required for the construction of the sanctuary, goods and services. That is, there needed to be the raw material which the tabernacle and its furnishings would be constructed. That included, of course, gold and silver and precious stones and animal skins and spices and ointment and fine cloth. Then there also needed to be skilled workers, both men and women, who would fashion these raw materials into objects of beauty. Some of those who gave to the tabernacle gave of their goods, while others gave of their skilled abilities to create a place that was great in beauty and worth. And so two things were needed to construct, goods and services. And lastly, number seven, the contributions of the Israelites in, in, when the call came for them to build the sanctuary, the contributions of the Israelites were of the highest quality. They're of the highest quality. The tabernacle was to be of such high quality and craftsmanship that it would befit the God who would dwell within it. Isn't that what God said in Exodus chapter 25, verse 8? Make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Thus the material used in the building were the finest that were available. So too were the craftsmen. They too were to create intricate and beautiful works of art within the tabernacle. God was given the finest men, men had to offer, and all the finest things they had to offer, whether they were goods or whether they were services or skills, God was given first place. And so here are the seven things that we can learn from the children of Israel in their giving to the construction of the tabernacle. They gave voluntarily. They gave willingly. No one had to coerce them. No one had to twist their arm. They gave willingly. They gave munificently. They gave recognizing that it was God who was going to dwell in this place. They gave generously, more than generously. Everyone gave. Not uh, what The burden wasn't on one or two or ten people. They gave what they could. And they were to give both goods and services. It's interesting because every now and then I run into individuals who... Uh, who give of their time for the work of God. And they think that excuses them from giving goods for the work of God. But both are required. And then there are those who say, well, I've given enough and I give my means and I give my, my monies and so I don't need to serve and to work and to do some things in the church to serve the Lord. But notice both are needed. Both are necessary. And then, of course, the last principle we can take from this story is that they gave their best. You and I are to give our first, our best to God for, for his work and for his service, not the leftovers. You know, sometimes the church becomes a dumping ground for secondhand stuff. Every now and then uh, we, uh, you know, we'll, every now and then we can, we'll open the gate and there's something left there, uh, something that someone left and uh, it's kind of secondhand, someone, something someone didn't need. Um, books and things that are donated, and those are nice. The library certainly needs donated books for sure. But God's service and God's work requires the best. The best, not leftover things, not second best, but the best. And uh, especially as we consider the work of God and his service. Now, it's interesting that what we see here recorded in Exodus chapter 25 through 40, essentially, is similar to the spirit we saw, we see in David's time, King David's time, when he was to construct or build the temple. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, the Bible says, the people rejoiced for they had offered willingly because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord and King David also gladly rejoiced. So when time came for them to build Sol what came to be known as Solomon's temple, folk gave willingly for the building of that great edifice. And then it was also seen this, this willing, this 
uh, magnanimous spirit, this munificent spirit was also seen when the exiles returned from Babylonian captivity and they came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and under the leadership of Zerubbabel, the Bible tells us in Haggai chapter one, verses 12 through 14, so the Lord stirred up the spirit of all the remnant of the people of God and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. When you read anything to do with the temple and the tabernacle and the service and the work of God in ancient Israel, it seems many times over the people gave willingly. Now there were problems along the way and next week we're gonna talk a little bit about that. But when something needed to be built, when there was something that needed to be done, in the service and in the work of the Lord, we're told and we read in scripture that people did so willingly. People did so happily. People did so voluntarily. People did so munificently. People did so in one accord. Now, the giving of the children of Israel, the Israelites in Exodus 35 and 36, certainly was voluntary. But what about some of the other Old Testament texts and even New Testament texts that command the people to give in a different type of way? There are some Old Testament verses, uh, instances where giving is taught, and when it was taught, it involved mandatory contributions, not voluntary gifts. For example, in Exodus chapter 30, and I'd invite you to just turn there with me, Exodus chapter 30, verses 13 to 15, the same term... For give or giving in chapters 35 and 36 is found in chapter 30, but it is a distinctly different type of giving. In this context, it's mandatory. Notice verses 13 through 15. Exodus chapter 30, 13 through 15. It says, this is what everyone among those who are numbered shall give. Half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 giras. The half shekel shall be an offering to the Lord. Everyone included among those who are numbered from 20 years old and above shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel when you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. And verse 16 goes on to explain what this temple tax, so to speak, went toward, and you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting, that it may be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. So notice, there are at least two different ways in which this contribution differs from chapters 35 and 36 that we read about earlier, in spite of the fact that the same term for giving is used in both instances. First of all, The contribution here is not a voluntary matter, but it was compulsory. Everyone was to give 20 years of age and up. Secondly, the contribution is not one that was proportionate to one's financial uh, ability, but all the, the rich and the poor, anyone in between, were to give the same amount. And the gifts, if you go to Exodus chapter 38, the gifts went toward, they were uh, the silver and, and the brass, they were boiled down to end up making sockets for the curtains and hooks uh, for the curtains for the sanctuary and also for the, uh, the enclosure of the sanctuary. So while there are some areas, this is what we conclude, while there are some areas where giving is optional, a matter individual of individual leading, there are also obligations which no Christian should dare to neglect because they are mandatory, they're not optional. The question is why? Well, giving in this instance for the tabernacle didn't need to be mandatory. When all the children of Israel came and they came willingly and they came voluntarily and they brought their things, it wasn't needed, it wasn't a mandatory need because the motivation of the children of Israel was extremely high. The tabernacle was the means of God personally dwelling in the midst of his people. This was a one-time need for which the people had been aptly uh, enabled to contribute. Remember, before they left Israel, Egypt, rather, God told them to take from the Egyptians gold and silver and some of these things. And so God had provided for them already to be able to provide for the needs of the building of the sanctuary. This was a one-time need. This was an opportunity that would be of great personal benefit to the donor, to the giver. 
And with this motivation, God could easily allow the nation to provide the skills and the materials for the tabernacle voluntarily. Now, this isn't to diminish the enthusiasm or the generosity of the people, but simply to explain why such generosity would be easy to practice in this instance. But there are other needs in Israel, however, which are not so glamorous and which were of a much longer duration. And to ensure that these needs would be met, God commanded his people to give specific things. For example, there was, an, and you'll know where I'm going with this, there was, a, there was an ongoing need, ongoing need for the support of the priests and the Levites who devoted themselves to the service of God in the tabernacle. They didn't have a livelihood. They didn't have, uh, weren't given property in the, in the land of Canaan. They weren't to uh, grow crops and weren't to take care of uh, livestock. They were to care for the services of the sanctuary. They were to care for the spiritual needs of God's people. And so how were they to be supported? They were to be supported through the tithe. That's right. That was something God told his people they ought to do. This wasn't voluntary. This was something that they were commanded to actually do because it was an ongoing need, something that needed to be supported. There were also other needs that the sanctuary and the services required uh, for the ongoing support of the services of God. Go with me to Exodus chapter 27. Exodus 27 verse 20, we go back to that first scripture we read earlier on. Notice Exodus chapter 27 and verse 20. It says, and you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn how often, friends? Continually. So the people were commanded to provide oil for the tabernacle light that the light would always burn. This was obligatory. People were to continue to bring oil from pressed, freshly pressed olives. And there are Christians today who don't like that type of giving, where they feel obligated to do something. They would rather do it when they want or if they decide to do it. In the name of New Testament liberty, Christians tend to give more by impulse and freedom. And all too often, some of these individuals fall for gullible, uh, some of these folk are, are gullible saints, I should say, given uh, to, given to uh, respond to subtle or not so subtle persuasive techniques of some unscrupulous uh, huckster that one might be listening to on TV and just give out of spontaneity because after all, if you don't give, a financial crisis is going to come to you. Is it? That is what's told. And so you better give to this ministry or to my ministry or, or whatever. That's what is told often. Consistency in giving is also not very evident uh, and seen in the, uh, in the churches. Consistency in giving is, is too seldom uh, evident in individual giving. We can see the results in lots of churches and ministries. For example, the, uh, the income of some months, let's take December for example, which is the tax deductible gift time, is generally high, while other times, for example, the summer months, when folk go on vacations, falls off significantly. And so instead of seeing a consistent giving trend in the church, it is during the summer months down, and then toward the end of the year, it comes up high, especially the month of December, because that's the tax-deductible gift time. Meanwhile, while giving va vacillates radically, financial needs and obligations are always needed. And so the ministry of the church often hurts and often struggles for want of means. Sometimes the saints are fickle in their giving, most of us would rather designate our giving to projects that capture our imagination or give the appearance of something significant than just simply paying the mortgage or paying the light bill or the electric bill of the church. We would rather support prominent and visible individuals rather than those with quiet, substantial, unseen ministries. Rather than giving consistently to the general fund, Church folk generally divert their gifts to one cause or another, which can create financial havoc for our church treasury team. Can I get an amen out there, Brother Treasurer? <laughs> people include, people including Christians, are eager to create, but not always eager to maintain. 
Not always eager to maintain. Looking at giving in another way, people are much more inclined to give towards something that they can see, something that's tangible, such as a new building project, than they were to give more, to, more abstract needs, like operational expenses, paying for the heating bill or the air conditioning bill. Now, this is certainly inconsistent when we remember that faith focuses on those things that are not seen versus those things that are seen. Why is it then that we can say that we trust in what we don't see, but we won't give to anything that we can't see? What am I suggesting? Simply this. We should delight in those opportunities to give, which might appear to be a little more exciting, a little more dramatic, or a little more obviously significant. On the other hand, we must be faithful. We must be faithful in giving to the more mundane needs that must be met in the cause and the work of God. And these obligations may not be a delight as much as they are a duty. But if they are our duty, then let us give them happily. Let us give them willingly with diligence, with discipline, and with regularity. And when special opportunities arise, we may have occasion to give. Let us never neglect the mundane in providing for the magnificent. Does this sound a little legalistic to you? Structure, consistency, discipline, they may become legalistic if we want them to be, but the lack of structure is just as wrong as having too much rigidity. We must have both form, structure, and of course freedom, individual leading in our giving. So to put it another way, Put it another way, biblical giving includes both the joy of providing for some exciting projects along the way that move God's work forward and the delightful discipline of meeting those more mundane needs which are our obligation to supply. These principles, interestingly, not only just apply to money but also to ministry. First, ministry, like money, involves both the... In exciting tasks, which stir us to action, those routine tasks which must be done versus the routine tasks which must be done, which must be carried out. And sadly, there are some who seem to disregard the regular, the routine, consistent ministry, especially when ministry isn't that public. They're continually waiting and looking for some significant ministry to be a part of that really grabs them, that's exciting, that they're eager to be a part of at any time ready and willing to perform. The reality of the Christian life is that the great bulk of Christian ministry is that of maintenance work. That's the bulk of Christian ministry. It's maintenance work of doing those things that must be carried out in order for the work of God to continue. Week after week, we have Sabbath school classes the children come to, and those need to be staffed every single week. It may not seem to be exciting to some, but it still needs to be done. It's still something that needs to be done. The church, week after week, needs to be cleaned. It needs to be done. Week after week, the bills still need to be paid so that we can worship, so that we can use this place as a, a, a center of training for our membership, uh, for evangelism, and for ministry toward and for our community. There are some of those mundane things that just still need to be done. These things we are obligated to do. There are those few opportunities which arise in our lives which really do catch our imagination, which inspire us with vision and with enthusiasm. These are the exciting kinds of ministry which should not replace or supplant those maintenance kinds of ministry. In fact, I would go as far to suggest that those exciting ministry opportunities often arise in the process of our being faithful to perform our more mundane ministries. When you flip through the Bible, you'll see examples of this. For example, in the New Testament, Zacharias. Zacharias was visited by God's angel and told of the birth of his son and thus the coming of the Messiah in the course of doing his duty. You can read that in Luke chapter 1, verse 8. And then in Luke chapter 2, Anna, the prophetess, she never left the temple serving there night and day for what must have been uh, more than 50 years. And on one such day, the Christ child was brought into the temple where God privileged her to witness his arrival. Barnabas and Saul, 
Barnabas and Saul were set apart, ordained for missionary service, for ministry, while they were actively engaged in performing ministry. And so some of the exciting ministry opportunities often arise in the middle of our faithfulness to perform some of the more mundane duties. Secondly, money money and ministry are related in that proving ourselves faithful in the little things of money is often the test that God requires us to pass before he'll give us greater responsibilities and opportunities. We're told in Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 12, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Now, we're going to come back to the verse we started with in Exodus chapter 27 and verse 20. We're going to have it up on the screen for you. And it, the context of this statement um, is taken from the book Testimonies to the Churches, volume 9, page 248. I'd like to share with you how Sister White, Ellen White, applies this verse about the oil uh, being constantly provided so that the light might always burn in the sanctuary. Notice, the Lord instructed Moses for Israel, and now she quotes Exodus 27, verse 20, Thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. Now notice how she makes the application. This was to be a what, friends? Continual offering that the house of God might be properly supplied with that which was necessary for its service. She doesn't end there. Notice she closes by saying, his people today are to remember that the house of worship is the Lord's property and that it is to be scrupulously cared for. I don't mean to take away from the importance of the moment here, but I want you to notice here, just as God's people brought the, were to bring the olive, the oil, olive oil, so that the light might continue to burn in the sanctuary of old, so today, and that was a continual offering, so today God's people are to care for God's church, his structure, his building, and it's to be scrupulously cared for by his people. There is a point to all of what I've been saying. There is a point because we're coming to the end of a year. And if you've been paying attention to the church ministry budget item, you'll notice that we are about $29,000 short of our budget for this year. Now, God bless you for giving. All that have been giving faithfully and giving what you can. But this is December. And we need to get to the end of the year. And we not, don't need to just get to the end of the year. We want to surpass our, goal, our, our budgetary goal. And so next week, as is our custom around here, we collect a, an annual love offering. It's considered to be the big gift, the big offering of the year. Right after the services, actually during the services, but right after the message, next week there'll be baskets up front. And uh, some of you have already received my letter in the mail talking a little bit about it. And you'll be given the opportunity to come forward and give something, something bigger, something more grander, something more glorious. We're encouraging next week and through till the end of this year a magnificent gift, a, ge- a more than generous gift from God's people. So we can not only get through this year, but we can take care of those things that need to be taken care of to get us through to the end of the year and into next year. God's work, God's house, God's purpose, his plan for his people is that these things be taken care of as we give faithfully and as we give consistently and as we give generously, munificently, there'll be more than enough to go around to share for God's work and for his place, for his building. We have some very exciting and interesting things we're going to be sharing with you also in an upcoming business meeting next year the third Wednesday in January, and we would love to see everyone come out. Very important things. We're going to share with you a presentation, and it has to do with God's house. It has to do with God's work and uh, what we need to do here and in Sacramento. And uh, we have some very exciting and some very important things that we need to share with you and that we need your input and your blessing on. 
And so here we are, friends, at the end of the year. Here we are at the end of the year. And in our desire to do what is a delight, let us not neglect our greater responsibility to do our duty. In our desire to be fulfilled, let us never forget our greater obligation to be faithful. In our occasion to give, in giving to majestic causes, let us prioritize on the ongoing duty to maintain the work that God is performing in our, in Sacramento Central's very midst. You know, Desmond Doss became a hero on the battlefield, not because one day he went out there and decided to be a hero. Desmond Doss didn't become an example for others to emulate and to follow, not because one day in the heat of the war he decided that he wanted to. Desmond Doss brought help and he brought hope and health and healing and happiness to others, not because one day in the midst of the tragedy he figured out that he should do it. Desmond Doss was one was who he was on the battlefield because Desmond Doss practiced faithfulness in, reg in regular, more mundane things of everyday life. What he practiced behind closed doors when no one could see him, he practiced on the battlefield where everybody could see him. And God is inviting us to be faithful in the smaller, in the littler things. Not be so drawn to the more magnificent and more compelling ministries, but to take care, yes, you can give, but to take care of the needs of home, to take care of God's house right here in Sacramento Central Church, to be faithful in your giving, to be faithful in your sharing of what God has entrusted to you. I want to share with you a verse from the Bible. God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. When you give and you give to the Lord, always give so cheerfully. He's given us so much. He's granted us so many things. And the least we can do is to give heartily, to give our best, to give our all, to give everything we can for God and for His cause. What do you say? Amen. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to saccentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.